So uh, a number of places I mentioned here are Omaha landmarks that some of you may be familiar with, but uh, anyway. Uh, experience sings to innocence. Go ahead, softies and softettes. Take your unearned thrills at Disneyland, Sissyland, six safety flags over fill in the blank. Give us long gone Playland Park and writer beware. On the wall of death you thought might really kill you. With a silver bullet which could fling you out over the midway after your frazzled seatbelt snapped. With a tilt a whirl which spun you three ways simultaneously and left you hurling up your corn dog and knee high. <laughs> you also missed out on Peony Park with its four million gallon pool tinged with chlorine and urine. <laughs> in which someone drowned nearly every summer, and where you could lose your breath and bodily fluids if you belly flopped off a 30-foot tower, or kill or cripple some unsuspecting dog peddler below, not to mention you, and where jockeys from the local track carried their grudges and switchblades, and you might get mugged some in the evening on the fake beach. We also had the playground at Washington Elementary, if the slide didn't give you toxic splinters, it would sear your ass on an August day. And you could flip off the trampoline onto the concrete basketball court. And Mr. Buell, or any other teacher, had license to smack your head repeatedly against the cyclone fence, like he did Robbie Day, who giggled during his lecture on playground self-control. Go on, wusses. Light up for Pinocchio's daring voyage. Haunted mansions, Space Mountain, and Snow White's scary adventures. But when it's time to take your first ride on life's magic clusterfucker, don't come cry to us. My book uh, that's about here for sale, um, mind you, that, uh, is uh, uh, based on uh, my version of the Fool Archive, which has been in existence uh, from time the first story was told in the first cave, and, uh, and it's all around us today. There are fools everywhere. Uh, uh, everybody plays the fools in their air nipple sometimes, and we all do. So I, I've been fascinated with this figure until I saw my first uh, Buster Keaton movie. So uh, this is a bunch of uh, poems from the new book. Uh, first one is called Robin Fool and His Disconsolate Men. Uh, this is my version of the Robin Hood story, modified somewhat. Uh, I want to remind you before I get going, there's a bunch of Robin Hood characters named in this, and the, the two of them you need to remember are King John, who was the bad guy, and the Sheriff of Nottingham, who was his henchman bad guy. So, uh, remember, they're, they're naughty. Robin Fool and his disconsolate men. The snake rose right away. The rich had troops and portcullises, making it very risky to rob them. And the poor, we're supposed to receive this way, not surrender it. So fool decided they'd rob the not so rich. However, rob them enough and they become poor. Give enough to the poor and after a while, they become the rich. The dispiriting treadmill, Alan and Dale, the men's minstrel, tried to make up a song about it, but couldn't think of a good lyric. Little John grew morose and Friar Tuck doubled his windy prayers. Fool suggested they get into forest crafts, <laughs> whittled whistles and bowls, leaf pillows, war tusk pipes, rabbit's feet, bowls and pillows, bowls and pillows, sang Ellen the Dale, then faltered. Fool suggested they could use a catchy slogan. Stop here or we kill you, offered little John. They considered, don't settle for that crappy town stuff when you can buy from the merry men. Too long, muttered Will Scarlet. And not all of us are men, chimed in Mate Marion. How about, you want to buy this? Will suggested. Well, no one saluted when they ran it up the flagpole. The progeny of King John and his pal, the Sheriff of Nottingham, later weaponized the concept, deploying the first ad agency, which allowed them to rob pretty much everybody.
<clears throat> Who invents the piano in 1250 AD, which you'll, uh, you're probably aware that most people thought the piano was invented much after that. Uh, I need to remind you of the old notion of uh, uh, an infinite number of monkeys and an infinite number of typewriters. You've heard that, and then one of them's going to type Hamlet. Not, not the word, but the whole play. I always feel sorry for the monkey that they got the last word wrong, you know? So, <laughs> so who invents the piano in 1250 AD? Like the monkey that accidentally typed Hamlet, Fool, tinkering in his workshop, constructed an exact likeness of a Steinway concert grand, which he called the making sounds with little hammers on wires machine. <laughs> it looked impressive, but he was puzzled about what to do with it. It was too big and complicated to be a doorstop, and too heavy and lopsided to be a wheelbarrow. So he tried using it to scare rats out of the hayloft. But the rats weren't impressed, and he sprained his back winching it up. Fool pushed on the levers to make high sounds and low ones, wondering why he made some levers black. The neighbors, hearing eerie noises from his house, suspected Fool of conjuring evil spirits to cast spells on them. Several broke out in goat-shaped rashes, Others began speaking gibberish. Soon, Fool found himself trussed atop his machine, which was then dumped into a lake. As Bartok's began up in character number one dawned on him. There's <laughs> <coughs> a biblical one. Fool undertakes a holy mission. Because Moses is busy chasing down rumors of a golden calf, he orders Fool up Mount Sinai to find the burning bush and report straight from the horse's mouth what God's latest tantrum is all about. <coughs> Arriving topside, Fool finds nothing but a field of shrubs. Baffled, he lights one on fire and hopes it will attract God like chicken innards do those big catfish. After the fire goes out, uneventfully, Fool tries searching the ground for clues. All he finds is a pile of white and fox feces, which, when he inspects it closely, resembles a grandpa sporting a snow white beard, a lot like God's. Fool, cradling his find back down the mountain, discovers Moses lovely watching a golden calf orgy. So you thought they'd fall down and worship this pile of shit in place of getting smashed, dancing, and fucking their brains out, Moses demands? Who explains that the shits are parts irrelevant? The pile's an icon, revealing God's purity and goodness. Take a closer look, he says. Disgusted, Moses couples up a set of rules he hopes will end the debauchery, chisel them on a couple of flat stones, and declares God sent them. Drown out, migraine throbbing, he retires to take a nap. <laughs> Glory to fool. After trying to write a couple of poems, Fool decides to submit them to a trendy literary magazine, failing to notice he's mixed them up with his grocery list. <laughs> Orange knee high, patent crunch, Velveeta, SpaghettiOs, hamburger helper, moon pies. Almost at once he gets an acceptance letter, <laughs> praising the depth of his edgy ellipticity and saying he's been awarded the breakthrough prize. The next issue contains an analysis of the poem lauding its plunge beneath the rational world and into the vortex of chaotic indeterminacy, the tinted tabular cacophony of sound, and the absolute abdication of sense. <laughs> All of that done with what first seems an everyday catalog, but which blooms into a vehicle for a profound ontology. <laughs> Fool, always here to please, assembles a book-length grocery list, which requires considerable repetition. Raves echo throughout the world of avant-garde poetics, 
especially for the repetition, which is said to launch a new poetic style, or to the initiated, any style. Parton, who composes an epic consisting of the letter F repeated for 900 lines. When he's run over by a fire truck, he dies and here his lines will live on in the hearts of poetry's dozen or so readers. <laughs> I'll end up with um, one from the, uh, my previous school book. This is called The World's Biggest Rule. At the doctor's, Poole notices his weight's up almost half a ton. No wonder his jeans cut. His old shoes pink so. He gets a new outfit at a big men's store, which helps till he puts on another two tons. Tabloids show an interest. The fool finds himself thinking big, hatching ideas that wouldn't have squeezed into his normal size head, now larger than a big boy statue's. Is the pleasure of the pig as great as the pleasure of the philosopher? He asks the mailman. Feeling concepts roll through his mind like happy sea otters. He begins to see through the pea soup of everydayness, then through corduroy, then oak tables. His doctor says it must be a nervous affliction, brought on by chronic ineptitude and water retention. <laughs> he prescribes strong diuretics for two weeks in the Cayman. The fool has grown too big to fit inside a plane or atop a cruise ship. He acquires his own field of gravity, then bounds through the ionosphere and into space, where he takes his place as the ninth planet in our solar system. China draws up plans to colonize him, the CIA to terminate him with extreme prejudice. Now, God has to admit, fools jam the gears again, making it difficult for everybody. Meanwhile, fools discover the missing link, the lost cord, the cure for cancer in old age, and devise a half hour work week. He's really, really big now, too big to kill with a bolt of lightning or the old pillar of salt stud. Fool's heart takes up a galaxy. There's room in it for all humankind, even burdens on society and threats to public decency. Everybody, which of course includes God, now adrift inside that humongous ticker, flushed from oracle to ventricle, awash in the blood of a fool. Out goes sin, out goes death, in comes the free pass and the truly bottomless margarita, which set off God's doomsday device for when life gets too good for our own good. Bang goes the whole shebang, leaving God back at square one. Okay, God damn it, he sighs. From the top, let there be light, blah, blah, blah. Back on earth, fool, reincarnated to his old size, and kick me grin, grabs a fig leaf, and tries to look busy. <laughs> <laughs>